Having concluded the Lord's Supper, ask if you will to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Much as we did in our first session, we are going to be looking at an example of faith in action. You know, I think one of the one of the things that we see so vividly in the Old Testament. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to borrow a pew Bible. It turns out that uh, my paper Bible, Daniel chapter 3, is missing. <laughs> I always study using my electronic Bibles, and I had not been able to find it. My, my main text is not there. <laughs> Of course, I guess I could always revert it to my electronic Bible, but thank you. We're going to be looking at the book of Daniel this morning at another example of, of faith in action. One of the things that the Old Testament clearly provides us, and I think one of the values of studying the Old Testament is seeing this. We see so many examples of faith in action. You know, in our first session, we looked at David's faith in action against Goliath. We have Examples of Abraham and his faith in action, Noah and his faith in action, Moses and his faith in action, and so many Old Testament characters that we see faith in action. And I want to look at the story of three men that we know fairly well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and of course Daniel is a part of this story at the beginning as well. But just to paint the picture a little bit, and we're going to look at this a little more in detail in just a moment, but you have these men who were taken into captivity by the Babylonian nation, by King Nebuchadnezzar, and they were brought to serve the king. And in the time that they were there, they faced a number of challenges. And one of the challenges that's, that's interesting is a challenge Daniel would face later in life. Uh, when he would eventually be thrown into a den of lions. We're not going to spend time in that particular one this morning. We're going to look at some of the early days of their time in Babylonia when uh, they were faced with a couple of different challenges and see how their faith reacted in the midst of those challenges. And so, there we go. I, I have to apologize to Hugh Bozeman who's not here this morning. The last time I preached, I stood up here and I clicked this thing a number of times and I couldn't tell why it was so delayed and lagging in its response. Well, the reason was I had not turned on the remote. And Hugh was in the back, I didn't realize until after the lesson, that Hugh was in the back trying to figure out, based on what I was saying, when to advance a slide and when not to. And uh, so my apologies to Hugh for not knowing how to turn on the remote. Um, there are two particular instances that we want to look at in the lives of these men to see their faith demonstrated. One might not sound as challenging as the other, but it was for these men. And in Daniel chapter 1 and beginning in verse 6, we read of a situation where they are asked to eat a certain kind of food. Beginning in Daniel 1 verse 6 says, Now there were from among those, now from among those of the sons of Judah were da Daniel, Hannah, and I. <coughs> Excuse me. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, he, the chief of eunuchs gave the names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs, and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger your head, endanger my head before the king. Now to us in our day and age, this may not sound like a big deal. We're being asked to eat of the king's delicacies. He, you know, you're saying, we're captives in a foreign land. What an honor to be offered to eat that which the king has at his table and which he offers to his servants. 
We have to understand these men were Jews, and they had very strict dietary requirements. There were things where the Jews were unholy, and they could not eat. And so these men were faced with a challenge, and Daniel says, look, we, we, us four men, we don't want to eat these foods. And he says, look, you're, you're putting me in a bad situation. They're the one in charge of them. And we're going to go back and review this a little bit more in just a minute, but let's look at the other situation that they faced in Daniel chapter 3, a situation that we're also familiar with, beginning in verse 4. A herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And we recognize in verse 12 and 13 that they chose not to do this. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the prince of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. So here are the two situations that you have that we are going to talk about for a few minutes this morning. The first has to do with eating food, and the other has to do with bowing down to an idol. And in both cases, there is serious jeopardy involved. There are serious consequences involved. If these men do not engage in the activities which have been proposed. Now I want to take for just a moment and look at these men. Let's look at how these men are described in Daniel chapter 1 and beginning in verse 3. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. I won't restart, but hopefully you'll get it from the rest of it. So, Thanks, Zach. Uh, verse 4, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So the men that are involved here... These are men of nobility. These are men that had a position of power where they came from. They came from the descendants of the king. These are men who uh, it, are described as young and intelligent. Young, by our definition, may not be early, may not be teens. They may have been early 20s, mid-20s. But the bottom line is these are men who were used to the finer things of life. They were used to being well-treated, and now they're, they're, they're in captivity, they're in a position where they don't have the power and control they once did. But these few men have been chosen for positions uh, within the new government, you might say, of power and, and of some prestige. So you can imagine the challenge that they face as they must weigh the, the, the consequences. Here are men, they were, they were captives, their, their country has fallen, and now they are under the rule and authority of a new kingdom. But they're given a chance. A chance to escape maybe what some of their relatives are going to suffer. And some of their friends are going to suffer because they're going to be in positions of service to the king. What I want us to think about as we think about the situation they face is the kinds of excuses they could make for the situation that they're in. Because this is one of the challenges that our faith faces. Is the excusing ourselves out of doing what we know to be right. They could look at it as, hey, our country fell. They, they could even blame God. Say, you know, we're here and, and our God wasn't able to protect us. And, and why should we bother to try to still serve our God? Things haven't gone the way we thought they ought to. 
And there's a new regime in control. I, we've, got, we've just got to pay attention to what the new regime says. They might have had a mentality that says, look, hey, we're up here around all these people in, the, in, the, uh, in positions of authority, and they're doing all these things. Who, who among our family is going to know? Who, who among the people of, that we're, that from the land we're from, who's going to know all of this? Who's going to know what we do? What difference does it make? They could have reasoned based on what we've already read. You know what? If we don't, we're going to lose our lives. And then what good can we do? You know, if I, if I lose my life, how am I going to be an influence for good? How am I going to be an influence for God if, if I'm killed? But now let's take a look at how they did actually react and see if we can learn from their actions. What we learn is, is they trusted in doing what was right, not doing what was easy. In verse 12 of chapter 1, Daniel says to them, he says, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of, young, of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacy, delicacies as you see fit, so deal with your servants." Daniel says, look, we believe this is the right thing to do. So we'll tell you what, you test us. You let us do what we know to be right, and you can in 10 days test whether or not we are worse off or better off than those who have eaten what the king has offered. He put his trust, they put their trust, in doing what God told them to do. How easy would it have been when they said, hey, look, when, when, this, when this one who was put in charge of them, Ashwinette, says, look, my job is on the line. My head is on the line. This isn't just about you to say, hey, look, you've treated us well, and, and we don't want anything to happen to you, and, and we don't want to have any, any negative impact on you, so I tell you what, we'll just, we'll just go along to get along. How many times have we heard that phrase? We'll just go along to get along. That wasn't their attitude. They said, look, put us to the test. And then... When you come down to chapter 3 and verse 17, you have a very powerful statement. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and He will deliver us from your hand, O King. You will recall that Nebuchadnezzar, after he heard what they had done, that they had refused to bow down to his idol, had said, I tell you what, I like you guys, I'm going to give you another chance. We're going to play the music again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look past this first incident, and I'll give you another chance to do it. And they said, no. If you want to throw us into the furnace, throw us. Our God will deliver us. He'll deliver us. Does it remind you a little bit of the story we read earlier of David, whose confidence was not in himself? They didn't, they didn't approach this saying, hey, you know, I think we can find some sneaky way out. We can, we can have some sort of prison break escape. We need to think about the fact that this is not in a land or a scenario. You know, today, even if we were to be thrown into prison for our faith under the current circumstances if for some reason someone in our country were thrown into prison for the sake of their faith we have all kinds of appeals and 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 the prisons here you you have to get three meals a day and they have to treat you right and and i'm not saying it's fun to go to prison never been don't have any interest in going i'm just saying that by comparison to what they would have endured the difference is is they were standing before the king who had all authority and power, and he had the ability not to go throw them in jail and wait for them to go through appeals court and appeals claims and decide whether or not the Supreme Court thought it was okay or that they could appeal to the Supreme Court and make sure all of their civil rights had been justified. The king had the right, as we will see he did in just a moment, to simply say, that's fine, I'll just throw you in the fireness right now. Let's go. Let's do it. Think about that. And yet, they were willing to trust in God. 
I want you to notice in connection with this, and I intentionally skipped verses 16 and 18 because I wanted to bring out two things about the way they responded. First of all, he says he's going to give them this chance. And in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. He says, we don't need to think about it. We don't need time to consider. We don't need to, to try to think about what our answer is. The answer is, we're not. There was no hesitation. Their faith was not a hesitant faith. Their willing to put their faith and trust in God was not a, hey, let's stop and think about this. Hey, I tell you what, let's all go back and reconvene and let's see if we're all on the same page and whether or not we think this is a good idea or whether or not we think we really want to go through with this. They said, look, we don't need to think about this. What's right is what's right. And our God will deliver us from this. But I want you to note verse 18. Because somebody says, well, yeah, it's easy to do that because they knew they'd be saved. But look at verse 18. But if not... Our God is able to deliver us. We know that He can. We have no doubt about that. In fact, we expect Him to. We expect our God to deliver us from your hand. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. They said, look, our God can and we believe will deliver us. But that doesn't change our faith if He chooses not to. How many times is our faith shaken by God not intervening in a way that we think He should? We look at our society today. I, I, I admit, I look at our society today and I often wonder why God has not somehow intervened in our society and with the amount of wickedness and the increasing wickedness in our society. I think of Sodom and Gomorrah and other nations for whom God pronounced judgment. And I, I sometimes wonder how our, how our nation has escaped that. And sometimes I wonder maybe it hasn't. I wonder if maybe some of the things we've endured are in fact the punishment of God. I don't know. We don't have the prophets today to, to specify that. But how many times today when something bad happens in somebody's life, maybe a loved one dies, that they've asked to be healed or is involved in a serious accident and we ask for them to recover and they don't, or we ask for something else to happen and it doesn't, we say, well, you know what? God didn't do what I wanted Him to do. God didn't do what I thought He ought to do. So you know what? I'm just going to give up on God. I'm just going to do my own thing now. That was not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they, they had so many reasons that they could have just excused themselves and said, you know, this just isn't worth it. But they said, even if God chooses not to deliver us, we're not bowing down to your idol. We know what's right. And what we see is that much like David, they were rewarded for their faith. In Daniel chapter 1 and beginning in verse 15, At the end of ten days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days when the king had said, that they should brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them, among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And as we're familiar in Daniel chapter 3, and beginning in verse 19, the Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. And the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded they to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. 
And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And those men who were bound in their coats and their trousers, their turbans and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceed, exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he arose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, to Sh spoke saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And note verse 27. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Now, I'm not here to tell you this morning that if you put your faith in God, everything in your life is going to go the way that you want it to. There are men that will stand up and say, well, if you believe in God, then you're going to be rich and you're going to have all your dreams come true. God doesn't promise that. Quite the contrary. Because the devil is at work in this world and he's doing everything he can to knock us down, tear us down. And sin is a terrible thing and it wrecks havoc on this world. There is a reward that is offered to those who have faith that nobody in this world and even the devil cannot touch. But we have to maintain our faith. We have to not make excuses. We have to not give up on our faith because the going gets tough. Once again, we see that their faith had an impact on others. As you continue reading in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and sent his angel and delivered him and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies. They should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other god who can deliver like this. The impact is, is that they were not allowed to even speak against God. It gave others the confidence and the freedom to speak freely about God and to be who they were if they so chose. When we are faced with challenges, we talked in the, in the first session that we have a choice of either cowering in fear when faced with a challenge or acting upon our faith. Here we, here we provide another alternative. We can compromise our faith. These men had every opportunity to compromise their faith, to say, you know what? We'll eat of the food. Nobody will ever know. Who will it hurt? We're in a foreign land. Do what they do. We're under their rule. We're under their authority. Others could get in trouble. If we bow down to the idol, we could be killed. What good would that do? But they didn't compromise their faith. Do we, for much lesser things, do we compromise our faith or do we act on our faith? If you're here this morning and you've never obeyed the gospel, this is an opportunity to do so. To acknowledge your need for Christ and His love and to be buried in the waters of baptism, to be a child of God. But if you're here and you have compromised your faith, or as we discussed this morning, you've cowered in fear, and you need prayers and you need encouragement, we're here to assist with that as well. And we encourage you to do so as we stand and as we sing. Hark the general.